Okay, <clears throat> we're recording. Today is the 25th? 25th. 25th of uh, April, 2018, and I'm here okay. at uh, University Commons with uh, Mary Bailey and uh, Mary and uh, her husband Al have been gracious enough to let me record the recording. But I noticed that Al was born in, Al is an Easterner like me. Yes. And, and were you, where were you born? You were born, born in Tennessee. In Texas. In oh, the, you were born in, in Texas. In the great state of Texas. Oh, you were born in Texas and yes. here I am. Far away. Bad mouth in Texas. No, no. It, it, we're used to it and it, you know, um, it makes you appreciate your, your heritage. I was yeah. born of German, German immigrants in this small town of Fredericksburg and uh, learned a lot about hard work and... Where is Fredericksburg? Fredericksburg is LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson territory. It's about 60 miles north of San Antonio. And it's a is it north or northwest? That's a good question. I always said north. And um, it I had, think of Dallas as north, but maybe, you know. I, Dallas would be f much farther away from us. I have relatives that make it to Fredericksburg. A town of about uh, 5,000, oh. settled by the Germans who came over in the 1840s from the Rhineland and took horse and wagon all the way up to Fredericksburg. Uh, the store, big state, Texas is a long, yes. this wide and long. And they had um, an Indian scalping along the way oh, uh -huh. of a youngster who left the circle of wagons and then ended up in this godforsaken place that had alluvial soil for about maybe two generations. And then it became this hard clay or stone, more suitable for ranching than for farming. So people became ranchers and conservative as all get out. There were Lutherans and Catholics and Chicanos and mm -hmm. interesting. Um, so uh, we were part of the Roman Catholic community there and town of 5,000, maybe 4,000 something hasn't changed much today. Is that right? It's about the same, except today um, my relatives, my grandmother and grandfather had a farm the 120 acres you got from, mm -hmm. was it Roosevelt, who gave land grant. So they had this farm, and uh, every Sunday they would take the horse and buggy or whatever into town. They would stay at a place called a Sunday house. Saturday, Saturday night, have dinner with folks, Sunday mass in the morning, then I think a lunch, and then go back to the farm. These little houses that are stone houses that have just an upstairs and a very small downstairs um, are now retirement homes exactly. for people. Uh -huh. They can't wait to get there. Uh -huh. People like us, it wouldn't be me, but they, they love to go there, they renovate a little, and then, you know, the town is, is welcoming and the German heritage. We have the Nimitz Museum, Admiral uh -huh. Nimitz from World War II yes. has his museum there. So we have that claim to fame. Was he an, a native? He was a native, born born there. I guess that's why they settled the museum there. Um, so it was it was good roots. Um, yes. Then my family um, eventually moved for better opportunity for my father to Virginia, where he worked with the federal government. And there, um, I'm the eldest of five girls, so the rest of us. Two more were born in Virginia. Um, that was also equally a good home. Uh, ended up in wonderful schools, and then the time comes for this 18-year-old eldest to choose a profession, and what would an 18-year-old female in 19... to 61, 61, what would you choose? Um, Secretary, Secretary nursing, or teaching. nursing or teaching. I, I got, well, no, I did three of the three. Because mm -hmm. uh, the summer, summer, I was a 
Secretary of the Treasury Department in D.C. and uh, found out that that was not the most conducive for me for happy living and so I uh, went to a Catholic School of Nursing in Portsmouth, Virginia, three-year diploma school, which was the way most nurses were educated. At that time, yes. Yeah. Um, wonderful dedication. Uh, I have to, I just have to think how times have changed. Eldest of five, uh, they gave me a scholarship. We worked through the year. I think I was home one Christmas or two, the rest of the time we worked. But I had room and board tuition for $800 for three years. And I'm thinking, you know, how could we have gone to what we are today? Uh, but we did. And in fact, because of that, that's how I got into the service. Um, I finished my three-year diploma school in Virginia, and um, I, I wanted a baccalaureate degree. And wanted Georgetown University, which was oh, yes. in my general area. Mm -hmm. And so... Great, great school. It's a wonderful school. It was, in fact, I interviewed there before the Diploma School of Nursing, and it was a very nice school, but it was still very expensive. And so I get to my June graduation of my School of Nursing, and I am accepted at Georgetown. I apply to the Navy. And on a family trip to Texas, that was my last family trip before starting Georgetown, the Navy says they can't use me. I said, oh dear, and I'm slated to begin. Applied to the Army, the Army said, come. <laughs> so uh, into the Army I go. Um, and they had this wonderful program where um, they give you two years of education, you serve three in return. Um, so the way that worked for me was just heavenly. It was a blessing. I, I owe my country so much. Um, you go through the two years at Georgetown, finish mm -hmm. the degree, and not only did I get a BSN, a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, Can but, I well, was I, I was a, a private first class for, the, well, I was eventually commissioned, that's true. Um, I thought anything I was in the service was just wonderful. Um, met Al, he was uh, getting his, finishing a graduate degree in history. I met him to try to talked to the professor I had. He was, Al was there, my professor was not. And I protested a C minus in a grade, which I thought was very unfair, uh, given the amount of effort and study one puts <laughs> into this history. Well, the grade didn't change, but I got invited to lunch. Oh, good. And the beginning of this wonderful journey with my husband to be. Um, Finished Georgetown in maybe July, the year. In October, I was at Fort Sam. Oh, you were they, there in July, though. Was not in there in July. Oh. Yes, I agree. Oh. October. We had air conditioning going oh. in October. I remember <clears throat> being by the pool in October. And just couldn't bring myself to go into the pool. I mean, this was October. What are you talking about? Isn't it worse? And it was still warm. Was, and it was warm. It yes. was warm and hot. And um, yeah. well, when my daughter was born in January, we were in shorts. Now, I bet if you wrote that to people in the north, they would have said, how can it be? Crazy. And the people from Texas write us now and say, when do you ever get out of winter coats? I mm -hmm. said, well, we emerge maybe in April. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. So what did you do? You had four, four weeks of orientation? Is that what they call it? Um, was it? It was four weeks. Must have been a month. Met this wonderful good friend who is still a good friend. And we ended up 
living together in D.C. Um, you know, we were a trial, I'm sure, for all those personnel. Um, the sergeants who tried to help us with marching, and mm -hmm. I think they finally just said, well, what was one comment, you know, ladies, the other right. <laughs> we never got right and left together too well. Um, got out to Camp Bullis. Do you mm -hmm. know Camp Bullis too? Yes. You do well, too? I didn't go there, but no, I know. You know of it and where? And we were, how did it go? Maybe that, is that where they had the demonstrations? That helped me. And demonstrations for? Oh, you know, field, this, this was the field. Yes, that was the field hospital. This was where, where That's we where did. we were supposed to be building the field, being part of the field hospital. We were, so many of us, well, some of us had, we were in these sort of dormitory uh, living arrangements with our cots. Some of, one of us had to wait and look at, watch the fire at night to make sure we all didn't burn mm -hmm. down. Um, three of us were taken to the middle of nowhere with a, one of us had a compass. And the incentive was you wanted to be back for dinner. So mm -hmm. we found our way through harsh country. And then actually a battle situation where some of us were patients and some of us took care of the patients. Um, that's where I saw the varmints, I mm. think, more than in the city. Yeah, we um. were, uh, we were, um, I think, spent four days in the field. That was our basic training. And um, one day we were shooting and uh, another day we were shot at. And that was our training. Well, that certainly gave well, we, you a we feel. We had to crawl through the bomb, underneath the bomb wire. And Say, you did do that. Oh yes, and they said, "Listen, we can cure bullet wounds. We can't. Oh, we can. We can cure snake bites, but we can't cure these 50 calibers that go oh. over your head." So um, you had to do that. That sounds like the Marines, doesn't it? A little. Yes, bit. it does. But yeah. um, it was. It, it was. It was interesting. And you fired a gun too? Oh yes, yes, we, uh, we yeah. fired uh, an M1. And, and uh, of course, this was a large class, a class of over 400. Oh. Mostly physicians, dentists, <clears throat> many nurses. Um, Sounds like it might have been the same, because we, we were taught to fire something too. Uh, and I just thought, you know, um, Geneva Code of Conventions, mm -hmm. I, I should not be holding this. Right. Um, but it certainly got a feel for what our, our soldiers mm -hmm. went through. Yeah. Uh, I was the only second lieutenant in that whole group of over 400. And the nurses used to come and say, I, I think your bars are tarnished. I said, no. <laughs> oh. That's... That's me. That's you. That's that. You have to but be able all, to laugh. But they went in as first lieutenants and captains and, and doctors, of course, went, went in captains, captains and majors and yeah. some LCs even. They were that were, I have that experience. And they all had to go through that. Oh, they all had to go through that. Yeah, you. and uh, lectures and most of the time, you know, half of this class was sleeping. They didn't even pay attention to what was going on. And these poor lieutenants who had to teach us were just so patient. And I, they must have, well, yeah, you do have feelings that uh, the gun part, I, I guess they could have explained that a little better, yeah. that, you know, that you're there to, to learn what it's like and not to particularly fire. Where'd um, you go from Fort Sam? Um, Fort Sam must have been maybe middle of our time at Fort at, uh Well, Bullis was halfway through Fort Sam. Then, how did they go? Uh, I think I must have asked for and received uh, orders for Walter Reed. Oh, so I went back. My home had been Falls Church, which is that greater mm -hmm. D.C. area. And... Um, ended up getting a flat with this wonderful friend I met. She was also at Walter Reed, we both went. Um, 
So we lived in Silver Spring and commuted. And, well, it wasn't a long commute to read. Um, Walter Reed then was receiving all the Vietnam veterans. I was on the back wards where um, many of them were. Um, and because I was on an orthopedic ward, and how did it? An orthopedic ward also had hemodialysis, which was the artificial kidney. So I worked in both. We had lots of customers, and um, I had not had that training before, education before, mm -hmm. and had good folk around me. And about, so this would have been December, you got into the beginning of the year, and then I got orders for Vietnam. My housemate, my good friend, got orders for Korea. Each, at, well, they didn't tell me where I was going. She knew, I think, the hospital she was going to. So you finish up your time at Walter Reed, and um, at some point, I think I received my engagement diamond, so I knew I had a life, a route, generally what was going to happen to me, and went through um, that summer, Al and I together, uh, and my, my folks were right there, had a, a wonderful time on a beach, I think, uh, and then packed up, and I was back in, I was in Vietnam in country by September 17th, I believe and entered the chief nurse's office, and you'll appreciate the Army. Um, well, Lieutenant Feaster, my maiden name, uh, where would you like to go? This hospital. Ah, no, story before then. Uh, coming over, it was Trans World Airlines, which I, I they flew. But I it flew, and I was one, how was it? maybe five to eight females with this sea of gentlemen all around. And so at some point in the flight, they said, um, how many of you would like to be in a hospital area uh, where you wear a white uniform? How many of you want to go to the boonies? Every single one of them wanted to go to the boonies, which meant boots and fatigues. And I just said, you know, it took me so long to get boots on and off, I said the war would be over. Mm. So my wish was given. I ended up with my uniform, white uniform, in Saigon, Third Field Hospital. Oh, in Saigon? In Saigon, the major city there. So you, you, were, you weren't in a um, mass unit then, you were in a... I was in, I was in a real hospital. The yeah. hospital we had was, had been a school for dependents. And it was a um, main building, which was administration for the hospital, and long corridors with sort of T's coming off. Yes. Mm -hmm. And those would have, I, I bet, been classrooms for the dependents. We came in, and they, we made wards out of them. And uh, in between was sort of a grassy patch where we'd have our, um, where they would, you know, call us to attention, and we'd have briefings in the morning. Um, if we had rockets coming in, which we've had on occasion, our enlisted would sleep there so they could be on duty the next morning. Otherwise, the enlisted were all living in all sorts of arrangements um, on, on, I guess, on the economy, or they, they weren't really weren't in barracks. Um, so I get to Vietnam, and the chief nurse, I tell her, well, I thought, based on where I had had experience, I should be on. And the one hemodialysis unit in country was at our hospital. And that was the, that was the technology that was going to save the war. Um, mm. So it was on one of the wards upstairs. I said, I said, Major, I said, I think I should be on that hemodialysis unit. That's where I had been. I said I took care of orthopedic patients. She listened and um, she said, well, Lieutenant Feaster, I, I think that's all true and eventually you'll get to that, but we need someone in ICU and that's where you're going. 
So, a good lesson in, in the Army, and I'm sure it's not just mm -hmm. Army nursing. If they need you someplace, that's where you go. That's where you go. And you know, if I had been as enlightened now as then, I would have just said, oh, well, the universe has these experiences for me. So that's where I should go. And it was where I needed to go. I needed those skills. Um, we had patients coming in, and they, we, they'd come in on stretchers, and we would, there's a picture of us, we put this sheets of uh, paper on our walls and we'd log in the patients and then we would do our looking at who needed to go where and many of them ended up in ICU. So I was in the ICU the first half of the year, true to her word, the last half of the year I ended up on our hemodialysis unit. Oh, you did? I did, I did. and. Um, Small unit, six, about six, was it six beds or four to six beds? Wonderful personnel. The sergeants all wanted to try to keep these folks alive, and we did our best. I'm sure I should really go and look at a hemodialysis unit today, but we had this great big tub. It looked like we were doing our Monday wash. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, Lots of Marines came to us, and how was it? Um, about 70% of them just, we, we, we just couldn't, right? they just never came home. So I was writing my letters to the moms, and I thought, you know, at the time, um, what a poor remembrance of a son to have a letter. At least I could say that we really, that they got infinitely good care, kind care from us, mm -hmm. um, but what what a waste for their family. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just the Americans, but uh, I took care of uh, the, mor was it the mornings, I could have some Vietnamese patients, and then the afternoons I would go for the Americans, and um, you know, if ever you learn what a tragedy war is. Um, the Americans never understood, or why should anyone understand war, but um, the 18-year-olds that I had would say, uh, how would they put it? They said, what in the hell do these gooks want? The gooks, I think Al said that was a pejorative term for Koreans too, but it was what they used for the Vietnamese. You know, we, we give them we give them small refrigerators. We had these tiny student refrigerators. Um, we give them. Bill, do you remember something called Ipana toothpaste? Yes. Do you have? It was sold on the black market in Saigon. So we gave them Ipana toothpaste, and then we've given them a new place to live. We took them from where they were. And um, I just had to think, as I heard this, what in the hell do they want? Then on my own unit, hemodialysis unit, I had a wonderful Vietnamese, South Vietnamese um, senator or assemblyman. He was in his 70s or 80s. And via an interpreter, um, I sat with him and I said, um, as he talked, my corpsman could say something to me. I was doing my assessment of him. The Army never helped me with any word, Vietnamese words. I knew, no, I knew nothing about their culture, not, nothing about how to assess. So at any rate, mm -hmm. they taught me the word for pain, I think, was Dao. And I bet it has all sorts of different connotations or tones. Anyway, my assessment of this wonderful man was Dao, 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 and if he flinched, I knew we had a problem. Otherwise, so as I'm doing my assessment of him, and the corpsman is sitting next to me, he asked me to put 
I said, tell me something about your family. He said for me to put my hand up. So I put one hand up. And he proceeds to go to each finger and tell me five generations of people that were his. Then he does a second hand. And he goes to more generations. And he knew the people. He knew the names. And because they were, were Buddhist, um, I, I think the earliest or the, the first son is the one who gives honor to the dead where they live. So where they live was very, very important. And where they stayed, their lifetimes were very important. Mm -hmm. Americans never understood that moving someone from where they live and plopping them over here couldn't have just been a really fine thing for these right. people. Yes. You know? Why didn't they appreciate it? Why, why didn't they? You know, we're giving them everything. And so that did, that and multiple other impressions uh, influenced me. And I'll say something about when I got back to this country. Um, we lost so many of those young men, um, terrible wounds. Uh, a lot of unhappy stories. One happy story was Bob Hope. Oh. He, came, he came to Vietnam with his troop. Now, who was the gal? Raquel Welch. Oh, my corpsman knew Raquel Welch. Um, and so he was coming. He was coming, I think, before holidays, because I ended up going to Midnight Mass, and I think he attended Midnight Mass at our hospital. At any rate, weeks before, um, we'd have our report, and so we got to the day. They'd say, Lieutenant Feaster, how many more days to go? And I'd say, for what? How many more did? Oh, oh, for her coming, for his coming. So I said, okay. So we get to the day, they come, they're going to come. I said, I know the date, I know special people are coming. I said, we have five patients, we need to take care of them. And then I said, let's see who can go down, because we were upstairs and the place was downstairs. So, I make my rounds, someone is hurting, and our medicine for hurting was morphine. So I checked, and I unlocked the morphine, and started signing out, and almost had the syringe, and then I heard strange things. And I looked around, my corpsman had taken every single one of the patients down the steps to see Raquel Welch and Bob Hope. Mostly and Raquel. Mostly Raquel. And so I said, oh my goodness. Um, so I sat and did my notes and about, I don't know how much longer, creeping up the steps. And I look at them and they put the patients back and I made my rounds again and I said, especially to this one private, I said, you were hurting so before, what do you need now? And biggest smile, oh, nothing, <laughs> not a thing. <laughs> and I had to laugh. If I had been in research, I should have researched Raquel Welch mm -hmm. and the power of morphine, because I think they probably would have run a close second, Absolutely. or she would have, she would have won out. Absolutely. So, have, you, have you been to a uh, dialysis unit since you've been out? Um, have I been to dialysis units? You know, maybe were, were not. Were they doing dialysis when you were in service? They were, they were doing dialysis. Mm -hmm. um, that was the unit that I was on. That was this big unit that you see. Um, after Vietnam, again, I would have thought I had been on a dialysis unit there. They might have said, but I was returning to Walter Reed, and Walter Reed said to me, where they needed me was the CCU, the coronary care unit. Where, where was that? Coronary care unit, CCU. So I come back in the process of planning a wedding, um, almost to a year to the date, September, come back to Walter Reed, and on this busy 
coronary care unit. Um, it learned learned a lot. You know, I will say the service is very good at yes. increasing your skill level. Um, ended up having this was a time when General Eisenhower was a patient, and my my housemate was on that unit, took care of General Eisenhower. I had on the coronary care unit, get his name right, Milton Eisenhower, his brother, oh, yes. who was a professor, I think, at Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. Wonderful man. He had fun with the private rooms and a good teacher. He listened, he was interested in Vietnam, um, listened to him. Uh, I learned, and then he got better, went home. Um, Halfway through that tour, I ended up getting married, December 28, 1968, this wonderful wedding in Falls Church, Virginia. Um, and then Al and I had settled in Bethesda area because I was still going to Walter Reed for my work, Garner Care Unit. And, um, those were the days where we were doing three shifts in a week, and it's not conducive to good health. No. I think we've learned that now, that you can't do that to people. I was doing getting up in the morning, going to bed earlier in the afternoon, and then getting up the next. Um, mm. So went on with that and ended up um, finding out that I wanted a master's, because I thought I wanted teaching as well. So I ended up going to Catholic University in D.C. Another good uh, school. Another was a fine school for me. And what was interesting about that is that when I came back, I had been enlightened. I knew that if I wanted to care for people, I didn't want, um, I didn't need more coronary care unit experience. I needed a way to understand people and their values and what was important mm -hmm. to them. Uh, that social work knows that already. All the training I really didn't get in the Army. I could have used then to understand uh, the Buddhist religion. I could have understood the war better. I could have understood the American place in it. So the broadest degree I could get at Catholic University was something called community health nursing, mm -hmm. you know, outside. Nice. And that turned out to be the degree I got. And even more telling was um, when we arrived in Michigan and I was hired by U of M, they wanted me to have an advanced degree as well. And again, I thought I didn't need advanced physiology or biology or chemistry. I needed to understand people, their values, what was important. So I made the rounds at Michigan. <clears throat> And the people that were the kindest and understood me the best were cultural anthropology. Is that right? And it was a, a wonderful discipline uh, for me. It took forever. I was, let's see, started in 76 through 86 to finally get the degree. And that allowed me to continue teaching, mm -hmm. which was a wonderful blessing, Bill. <clears throat> now, did you teach at the School of Nursing? taught at the School of Nursing here. Um, in I, I told Al that I, I worked very, worked for a long time with somebody who was a great friend of uh, Rita. Rita Dumas. Yes. She was quite a lady. I yeah. met her twice. I don't know much about her. Yeah. All I know about her is that there's a picture of her <coughs> in the hospital somewhere. Yeah. There is a hospital picture of her, and I think in the School of Nursing as well. Um, yeah, we've had good leadership in that school, I think. Uh, I was, at, let's see, I was at Michigan until Al received a Fulbright to go to China. It would have been 86 to 88, 80. Two years we were there, and then came back and um, ended up with a teaching career 
at Madonna University, which is in Livonia, mm -hmm. this small, smaller Franciscan school, which was wonderful. Um, again, for nursing, <coughs> and the values that we can teach. Stayed there until retirement in 97 and retired to um, hospice, where I sat with dying patients and said, if there's one thing I'm good at, that's probably what I'm good at. And because I was a veteran, I ended up at the VA, did volunteer there. Al did volunteer work through Notre Dame there. And I, they had a program, No Veteran Should Die Alone. Mm. I think it's, I'm sure it's still going. And so, you know, our, our veterans come from all over, and many times they just don't have family nearby. So we could go in and sit, try to help, try to comfort and console. So I did that um, for a long while until I ended up with a hip replacement and corneal replacements in this aging process. So, and also Arbor Hospice, which is our local hospice. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of my, my tale. Yeah, um, I, uh, I asked about <clears throat> the uh, dialysis unit. I worked in the dialysis unit for, I don't know, a year or two or whatever. Here, Bill? Yeah, I, actually it was, um, it was part of Fresenius, but I worked at one of the <coughs> places near the airport. Ah. <clears throat> And uh, they're something, they are, really. If you've never Talk you about been it. in there recently, they're... I should go. Yes. Um, Maybe I should just... Uh, there's one There's one at, um, you know, not too far from here at, at St. Joe's. There is one at St. Joe's because Persinius. I have been around that, that road that encircles the hospital, and yeah. I think there's a dialysis center. There is, yes. Mm -hmm. I should. I'm, I'm sure that if you call them... They would they, just, I'm they, sure, help me with yeah. how things have been updated since 19... I would think so. I would think so, too. But, um, yeah, and <clears throat> of course, uh, you know, that, you're eligible for that kind of care regardless of age. I think so. Yes, oh yes. Well, I think. Kidney disease is, is, is the one disease that uh, you're eligible for Medicare regardless of age. Isn't that good news? Yeah, and a fair number of people um, have, well, in fact, we have a, I have a friend here who has had a kidney transplant, lost it. No, she's lost a kidney, so she's living with one kidney. Um, you know, in former days, that would have been something you never would have recovered from. Mm -hmm. And look at how people now, and I know uh, Elle has a family friend who, of course, is having, they have home dialysis now, where you mm -hmm. just sort of oh, get yes. hooked up to a machine for two or three days or less. Maybe it's every other day, but it allows people to be home. They can often do it at night. Did you enjoy the dialysis? Was it good for you? I, I enjoyed the, the patients and some of the staff. There was a, a nurse that eventually got on the unit that was not my cup of tea. Ah. And we kind of locked horns and I eventually quit because I was retired. Yes. You know, I didn't need that nonsense. No, no, no. And she would, Petty and everything else. So. That's too bad, isn't yeah. it? But the, the patients, I, I just love the patients. They were great. They were great. And so appreciative of anything you could do for them. Yeah, they are. And and hopeful. I, yeah. I'm sure they go forward and want the... A lot of them were <clears throat> looking for transplants. Yes, waiting. Waiting and waiting and waiting. And, uh, um, what I would oftentimes recommend is that they look into um, Toledo. Toledo was much better. With having 
With kidneys available? Yes. Uh -huh. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it really is. There could be such a difference. Absolutely. You know, a lot of them are on the waiting list here in Ann Arbor. I bet that <clears> was a blessing that you could tell them yeah. that. I hope. A lot of them were on a waiting list with both, so, and, you know, that was, sometimes it was hard to coordinate that, but. Um, that gives new meaning, doesn't it, to um, giving permission for donor transplant. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, your, whether it's eyes or, or kidneys, kidneys are probably the most common. Yeah. And yeah. I, I hope a lot of these people get help before they, they lose hope. Sometimes, yeah. you know, we get so good at what we do that everyone feels like, of course, it's the answer, and it yeah. isn't mm -hmm. necessarily so. Now, when you were in the Army, what was your, your final rank? Or did you get to be captain then? I got to be captain. And um, just as I, before I, I was discharged, I guess, or before I left, end of my time, and then um, was out of the service for a while, um, taught, Al and I both were teaching at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, moved here, and when I came on board in, at Michigan, um, a Navy captain, as Al would say, the real, a real captain, but yes. whatever, mm -hmm. um, said, you know, what are you going to do in your old age? And I said to him, I said, I guess grow old. Um, he said, well, think of the reserve. So <clears throat> I still had enough years, and I went into the Navy Reserve and served, let's see, you, you exit when you're age 60, so I'm 75 now. Goodness, that's 15 years ago. Got out of the service, out of the Navy, but had wonderful years. I had 23 years altogether mm -hmm. of service time, um, which allowed mm -hmm. me to be eligible for, um, my goodness, TRICARE insurance, and yes. I have a, a pension. Mm -hmm. I, again, I said, I owe my country a lot. Uh, uh, What's the equivalent of commander? Is that a major? That would be a major. Yeah. Um, in the well, uh, Let's see. Equivalent of a commander would be uh, major, and then cur colonel. Junior. Three. Yeah, I think maybe a LC. LC. I ended up um, into the, the Navy and became lieutenant commander and then commander, left as commander. I think mm -hmm. commander is 05. I think that's right. Uh, yeah. So I think that's an LC. I don't know. I have to look it up. And you know, you, you, you forget a little, yes, right. which is maybe not a bad thing that you don't always remember, but. Um, Remember with gratitude, that's what I can. Going through your pictures reminded me of the uh, what can I say? Um, how uptight <clears throat> the army was at that time. We could not wear shorts until my last year in the service, and that was. Hot as blazes in Texas. In Texas. Yes. So they, they told you you could not wear? Well, you couldn't wear shorts until 1956 oh or 57. I'm not sure which. But then we had to wear knee socks with it. <laughs> That's the British Army. <laughs> Probably made a, a sharp looking oh, yes, yes. individual. Yeah. Uh, now this was, this was out of uniform? No, this is uniform. In uniform. I could wear shorts. You could wear shorts. Mm -hmm. Well, you were far ahead of Vietnam because the only thing we had. Well, I wouldn't wear shorts. Were boots and fatigues. Yeah, anyway. But uh, I was saying that <clears throat> we were kind of uptight. I, 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 one of my technicians was dating a, a nurse, and of course, I, I don't know if there's anything worse than an enlisted man dating 
a commission officer. Mm -hmm. They sure wasn't. <laughs> you know? Then not the Army didn't think so. <laughs> the Army didn't the think so. Hmm? Yeah, the Army didn't think so. They, they didn't condone it at all, oh, no, did they? Oh, no, not at all. No. If, if they were found, found out, uh, he would have been court-martialed. Court-martialed? Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know it was that kind of a... I knew that he just... You just didn't, and uh, and probably for good reason. I mean, if there had been a lot of dating, that would have certainly made duties not not as easy. Yeah, but we, were, we were in a um, a named hospital, you know. The, we were. I don't know if you, I don't know if they were teaching hospital, but you know there was Brook Army Medical and there was. Walter Reed, and yes. those were the two big hospitals. And I don't know what <coughs> what terrible things could have happened. But, but in their mind. You know, and it was also a training center too. Oh yeah, which could be. The, 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 they did a lot of training of, of technicians. <coughs> and um, the, you, you could always tell the uh, the training people, you know, every so often a general or somebody would retire and they'd have a parade. Yes. And, and we'd all have to get out there. And, and be, be the parade. Right. And you, you see the, the, the people from the hospital would march out there, and most of them looked like they slept in their uniforms. Oh, dear. <laughs> really? But you all were sharp, I bet. Well, not really, but the training people, they were sharp. They were. Oh, they had everything just military police in the back, and you know, march up there. Well, they were great. They were. They were great. Uh, the rest of us were kind of slops. The workers, the worker bees, had to be. Um, mm -hmm. You know what I remember about Brook is um, the burn center. Oh yes, and, uh, well, very famous, right? I have to, you know, I'm, another one of my stories. I need to take up your time, but no. my daughter went to Providence College <clears throat> when there was a, uh, a very serious fire. This was Providence in New England? Providence in Rhode Island. In Rhode Island. Island. Yes. And uh, do you remember when that fire was? I don't know, no. I was there <coughs> just for two years. You were teaching? 66 to 68. Uh, it wasn't. It didn't happen when I was. Okay. So, so I don't remember when my I don't even remember when my daughter graduated. Mm. But there was a, one girl who was uh, very seriously burned. Oh dear. <clears throat> and uh, she was flung to uh, Brook. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. All the way down from Providence. Oh yeah. yes. It's and, interesting. And, well, yeah. they they had. What was the, their patient to? Staff ratio was two to one, two patients to one. I'm sure because uh, they take it's that yeah. intensive yeah. to try to help. Um, I remember we had um, on on ICU we had uh, we had 12-hour shifts, and part of my 12-hour shift was the the evening, and we had incoming casualties, and we had two Americans brought in. And the story was that we had accidentally napalmed. Oh, God. Where they were, or they received napalm. So um, they came into my unit, and um, they could talk to me when they first came in. They told me what they had to tell me. And I know we were getting ready to transfer them, but I had them through the night. And by the time... I had them and then discharged to, I guess we flew them out of Tanzania. Um, they looked like fish. They, the mm. edema and the fluid, they had no more facial yeah. indentations. And I thought, I, I, I don't know how they were treated. We, I think, gave them soaks, 
but that's high intensity as far as trying to help people. Yes. And so the two to one ratio doesn't surprise me at yeah. all. And, and, um, you know, I don't, I, my memory's not that great. It may, be, it may have been three yeah, to one for a while. Well, you know, we have a very good, because I had students on a very good burn unit at Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and gee, it's been a long time since I've been there. Um, and so burn patients, I'm sure, had a high, high mortality. And that isn't the case anymore, just sort of like yeah. our dialysis. We've improved things yes. so that things are better for them. We, uh, Mary, when you, you were that story about the ones you saw in Vietnam, uh, was that in your regular unit when you were first there? It wasn't the renal unit. It wasn't the renal unit. It was the intensive care unit, ICU. When you first got? When the first six months I was there. Okay. Did you see many burn patients there? Um, you know what? Mostly just terrible, terrible wounds. Uh, why we had such a hard time in the hemodialysis unit, the kidney unit, is because we get these people. And uh, I think I even have a picture, which I should not have, um, of um, a man who just didn't have a side of his buttock anymore. Uh, they just bled to death. We just couldn't stop the bleeding. And here, when you're on hemodialysis unit, what they do is incoming blood gets um, heparinized so that mm. it doesn't clot. And then you go through the bath and you come back and then we restore the blood. Well, if you're already heparinized before you ever get into that point, they just bled and bled and bled. Um, so just not so much the, the burns, although um, we had tragedy one time with incoming patients, and Alice heard the story of um, called, we were called, I was off duty, called back to duty, red alert, so you go back in, and we had this area where it was all open, and that's where all our cots were laid. At any rate, I came to this opening, and I had crying Catholic nuns, I had screaming babies, and I said, oh, mercy, what has happened here? And again, an accidental bombing of an orphanage, Catholic orphanage. I guess, I'm not even sure whether it was how far outside of Saigon. So we got all of these screaming kids and nuns, and, um, and it, it's the first time I should ask the people here because I'm not sure of the medical term, but the whole abdomen was exposed in like toddlers. They had no more skin. You could see their, mm. their, intestines. their intestines. And so um, you try to hold them. I could send them, what I ended up doing, we sent this with patients too. We would send them with um, my corpsman, and I'd send them to the chapel, which was not far. And we would just sit with them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How long? Now the mayor, I, I, I mean, even with our expertise, I don't <coughs> know what we could have, have done. Mm -hmm. Maybe we helped some, but um, most of them. Um, Was so, that the only burn unit in the country? Uh, the well, there, there really wasn't a, a burn unit mm -hmm. out. Uh, the mass units. You know, they treated them as well as they could in yeah. their, their ER situation. I, and then probably, if we could hold them well enough, they were some of the first ones that would go out of Tansanud and get Arabac to, well, they could get to the Philippines, you know, where we had toured, uh, and then stabilize there, then on to Germany, stabilize there, and then, and then Walter Reed, or... Mm -hmm. um, what would be what would be a California hospital that they, um, they might stop at? Um, the Travis. Uh, Travis. Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. But the, that's not the hospital. Really. What is the big hospital that uh, we'll all that's we'll all right. remember tonight? Yes, I'll probably remember, remember tomorrow. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's when you do remember. Oh, that's where. That's, yeah. that's what it was. Karen's <laughs> husband was too, uh, right in San Francisco. Yes. It's was, right by the place that used to be the uh, military, and now it's a park. Yeah, now like it's a park. Gate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? It will come. Yeah. So, 
I'm going to just excuse myself. I just want to go and say hello to Bill. And you are still going on the interview. Yeah. So good. Thanks again for all the time and also for sending the DVDs. That's okay. Yeah. I, I hope they work out well. Mary will look prettier on the DVDs. <laughs> I've already had some customers, Bill, that yeah. lot my sisters would love. Um, <laughs> take care, Bill. We'll be in touch. Huh? Take care. Um, can you, well, can you trust me enough to let me take these things? Absolutely. You can. You don't have copies of them. I'd like to take them. Yes, please. <clears throat> yeah. and, Tell me your, your ribbons. My ribbons? I, I never got a ribbon. Oh. I didn't even, I didn't even a get a, I didn't even get a, a good conduct medal. Oh, mercy me. Well, and then I found out that commission officers aren't, are supposed to be good Good medal. conduct anyway. <laughs> oh, that sounds exactly like the Army. You don't need a medal, you know. Um, yeah. Well. You know, uh, when you think about it, the medals and the service, and you come home and you really, I, after all this, I said, how, how can we go to war when you've seen this terrible, terribleness? Right. And, and here the wars go on and on, Bill. And um, I really, for the longest time, I felt like I should be marching. I mean, I, 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 and, I and I went to the VA and I did, I sign up, and I told I was. I told my story to some of the nurses, um, but then I felt like you know I really couldn't endorse a president who endorsed the wars, and I said I shouldn't be here. I mean, mm. That's not fair. Um, and now I handle things better by knowing. I'm studying Rudolf Steiner, who is a man, a philosopher of the 19th century, who talks about going inward and trying to change yourself, and maybe changing the world through changing yourself. And um, that, and trying to get uh, more, more kindly disposed people who are against the war, came home an absolute pacifist. How can, how can we do this? How can we continue to do this? So it's a moral obligation for me, and um, you know, I, I I felt you know a lot of the people that I saw in Brook Army Medical were were World War II uh, veterans still, yeah. and Korean veterans, mostly Korean. Um, you know, it was just I don't you know how how can you endorse dropping bombs on people. Yeah. And, and too, for, for World War II, for Korea, but for Vietnam, it is said that there, there is many people that are not around the table for the Vietnamese, or many more families as the 58,000 that we lost for the Americans. Yes. So everyone is touched. Then Al and I were able to return to Vietnam. We were in China for two years. The interim of that, those two years, we went to Vietnam. 20 years after I had been there. So it was 1988, I left in 1968. And my goodness, um, kind people, you know, held nothing against us at all. Um, and now, of course, um, it's a country that has Kentucky Fried Chicken <laughs> and where you can go and watch where the Americans watch the bombs go off or rockets come in. Or, um, so we, we, need, we need to work on our, our country not to yeah. do this anymore. My wife and I visited the cemeteries at um, Normandy. Oh, did you? Yes. Aren't they something? It's chilling. It's chilling. The, the person who was the proprietor or whatever they call it said that, I don't know how many what the percentage was. It, it just was frightening. A number of people who were 18 and, you know. The 18, White Crosses. 18 year olds. 18 year olds, that's who we. That's. That's who we stand. Unbelievable. Yes, 
That well, is tell true. me about your ribbons now. Oh. I'm envious. Well, <laughs> I will gladly lend. Uh, they, ha they haven't seen the light of day in a while, so um, uh, let's see. Army Commendation Medal must be this one. This is service in Vietnam. And these have to do just with general service uh -huh. um, for the Army. So uh, before I left Vietnam, I think that's when I was given this, this medal, uh -huh. or, or, the, or the Commendation Medal. They, the Renal Unit put me in, my name in, for the Army Commendation Medal, which was a kindness. Uh -huh. um, and now, and then you think back. I often think that I, I should have almost just taken some names and just written about them. The, the uh, uh, representatives in this area, uh, Debbie Dingle and yes. um, Wolberg, I think his name is, are having Wahlberg. a... Um, program, I think, on May 8th, if that's a Friday. May 8th? Yeah, and it's primarily for Vietnam people. In May. So, uh, I, you know, I, you, do, you don't need me to invite you, but if you're... May 8th. It's May 8th, yeah. Well, it's, so it's already passed, huh? No, no, May. Oh, it's May. We're living in April. Oh, I should say something. Well, we have seen Debbie Dingle out of the cemetery. What was that for then? Was that not Memorial Day? She comes out, Veterans, Veterans Day. Right? Probably Veterans Day. She goes, she is a... Well, De Debbie and her crew were absolutely great <clears throat> in helping us get through all of the many things that we had to go through in order to get Kittles is Medal of Honor. And that must be very impressive. Historically. Well, it was four and a half years in the making. Oh my goodness, Bill. Um, I, I interviewed Charlie. And I was just about finished with it, and his, and his wife said, well, did, did you tell him about, I don't know, it was March something or May something? He said, ah. And he told me about it. Like, and I looked at him, and I said, well, he says, I'm a piece of cake. I eventually got to him and I said, do you mind if I get the ball rolling to change your silver star into the Medal of Honor? He oh, said, mercy oh. me. Is that the way that happened? That's the way that happened. That's the way that happened. 